There are some really important pieces to understand around low sexual desire and then how do you create a spark, right? So there's a number of reasons why one could feel low sexual desire. There's endless reasons. Um, some of them are uh, issues that come through the system, through so the body, right? So hormonal, um, any kind of illness, uh, extreme stress, things of that, matter, of that kind can suppress the body's natural sex drive, right? Some of these things come with a change in hormones, but some of these things also just come through the adrenals or when people have chronic illness or things like that. So there's physical things that one can take into account and that one can work with in, in certain ways. But mostly there is things that come through life. And what I, and what I mean with life is that can be anything from stress or worry, or like you said, it's very busy, or there's a lot of external stimulus that drowns out the stimulus that's there, or the, the sensations that's there. And that you can work with, right, specifically. So how the nervous system functions, and then I'll talk about creating erotic friction or sexual attraction. But within yourself, how the nervous system functions um, is essentially that there's two systems, you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic, that have to kind of work together for optimal balance. And both of them, fight or flight, and um, what they sometimes call, you know, they call it fight or fi flight and feed and breed. And those two have to be somewhat balanced. And so within the body, both of them are present, but when one, for instance, fight or flight, but also the other, when there's too much feed and breed, um, you know, you get unbalanced and it affects your entire system as far as desire goes. And furthermore, the more input there's happening from the outside, the less you can hear the signals in your own body. And so you might actually have things happen there, but it gets drowned out by the much louder messages that come in through you know enormous amounts of email and you go everywhere you go there's tvs on and it's loud and there's sirens and there's helicopters and there's whatever right there's all these kind of things that can happen in the city particularly that make it so you can hear the signals of your body so all of those are options why you might have low desire there's also to make matters even more complicated because these things are multi-layered there's also relational, if we're talking about desire for your partner versus <coughs> desire for self-practice or being with yourself in a sexual, sensual domain. In, in the relational domain, there's also the dynamic of the relationship that heats up or dampens the desire. And so all of those things can be tended to. So physically, of course, I'm not a doctor or you know, in, in, in the healthcare field. So I'm going to leave that to people who know how to balance hormones and repair the adrenals and stuff like that, right? On the ex, in the too much input and not being sensitizing domain, sensitized domain, you can work with that. And for instance, in a women's group, we work with that, with the moving what you're feeling, becoming sensitive to your inner <laughs> landscape, and the sensations, that same practice, nonlinear movement, can also be used as a pleasure practice where you decrease the external input and feel the pleasure that's native to your body without external stimulus and bring that online, which helps a lot because let's say you, you don't feel any desire, that's zero, and orgasm is 100 Right? That's a lot of space to cross. And often people no longer have sex. I just read a study that, that in the UK, uh, people, they did some uh, survey of, I think, 16,000 couples, that people have having the least amount of sex that has ever been had while they did this research. Um, and there's a reason for that, and they are the reasons we're talking about, right? So zero to 100, that's such a bother that most people don't want to bother. You know, it just takes too much. Well, when you start engaging with your body, 
the bringing up of the background pleasure makes it so that you start at 50 or 75. But that's not so big of a gap to cross. So you can do sensitizing practices and things to bring your desire on internally. But then when it comes to relationship, and this is one of the things we're working with in this particular weekend, what we're looking at is that, this is, I always hate saying this. Some of you have heard me say this before. It always feels like such bad news. But actually, the better your relationship is, the less desire of that strong erotic explosive kind will you have. And yeah, sorry, guys. Um, but that's not necessarily bad news because you can actually make it happen very quickly. But the, the problem is that when two people um, have a good relationship, they begin to resonate, right? And the more you actually resonate and the more you have in common, the better your relationship. So when I still worked as a relationship counselor, my job in the early years of you know, me seeing clients was to get people on, to pull on the same side of the rope, so to speak, get them, on, get them in consensus, right? And you do that when you have relationship issues. You have issues around communication and shared values. Those are relationship issues, right? You don't agree on money. You don't agree on raising the kids. You don't agree where to live. You have different... Uh, food requirements, and you vote for different parties. You have relational issues, right? And then what you have to do is you have to go and bring yourself into resonance and pull on the same side of the rope, so to speak, and be relational. Now, the better and the closer your relationship, because it goes like this, you don't know each other, and then you get to know each other and you start resonating and you become very similar. And that, of course, is the death of erotic friction, which is this, super different. And so what often happens is the desire goes down as the closeness grows. And then what, what happens is that a few things can happen. One of the things that usually happens is people think their relationship is fucked because they no longer want to have sex. But that can also be the case, but often... It's they're so resonant that they just can't polarize anymore. And in the beginning, when you have that moment where you can't really, where you're resonating, you can't polarize anymore, you can still do things about it. So here are some of the things people do about it. Go on an exotic vacation where everything is different, so you, you feel different, so your bodies feel different, so you have great sex again. Open the relationship and bring other people in so then it feels different and there's a chasm and suddenly sex is great again. Cheat. It's another way that, or, or, you know, distract yourself in all kinds of different ways so that that different occurs. And then often the, the jealousy or the, 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 the juxtaposition creates the spark again and then it's all great again. But now you hate each other's guts and you've inevitably broken trust and you might fuck like bunnies for three months, but then you hate, hate each other and you no longer you know, have the sexual thing going on because that goes away again. So, so um, what's really useful is to learn how to be resonant when you want to be resonant, which is most of the time. But you just need to know that you will not have high desire for the sexual tussle in that moment because you're resonating. And then when you want to have the sexual and erotic friction, you do the things that come with that. And those are fairly simple things, and it's much harder to find somebody with whom you can resonate really well. And it's much easier to learn the tools for erotic friction. So first and foremost is if you want strong erotic friction for an evening, let's say, stop touching midday. Right? Because all that touching is rubbing off the, the polarity, so to speak. It's like rubbing two magnets together till they're no longer... You know, that this doesn't mean that you can't be loving and touching and everything in the rest of your life. But when you want that strong thing, stop touching. Stop being in the same room. 
stop talking about the bills while trying to have a romantic date. This is a big one, right? Meaning if you decide you want to go into that space, you can't talk about the kids or carpool or the gas bill. It, it just doesn't work. It makes you amorphous blobs that resonate together, right? <laughs> Versus distinctly different blobs that play with the spark between them. And then you do things like we did today, leading and following, where it's distinct, right? One person does the... And, and Steve added some distinctions there, right? Like the, 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 the pressure of shutting things down and, and containing it and the opening up and, and kind of creating space. So that's a good polarity dynamic, leading, following. Uh, what did you call it? Expansion and contraction. And then the other one we just did, and we'll go further into both of those, are structure and movement, right? So the engagement of life and death, so to speak, the, the strong, steady, relentless kind of, you know, let's call it penetration, not necessarily physical penetration, but of, of life, right? And life just unfolding you know, ever, ever beautifully and, and, and glowingly. And that's a really strong dynamic as well. So that, um, that kind of mystery and excitement comes back when you want it. And then the rest of the time, perfectly fine to be lovey-dovey and hold hands and have, be good parents and good friends and all of that. So it's skills that you can learn and that does help with the desire. And it's important to know that, you know, there's other things that, that play into that, right? Where the moon stands, what you ate, and all of those. But um, those are kind of the fine tunings. The rough uh, pieces are sensitizing your body so your body becomes alive and you can hear your body and learning how to pull apart. So, does that make sense? Okay, good. Thank you. More tomorrow. You want to say something? I want to just say one thing before you get started. I once caught myself, just, just, just to tell you that this is a fairly normal thing, I once caught myself reading the back of the peanut butter jar because there was no other entertainment to be had <laughs> during a breakfast. Uh, so this is a fairly normal thing. You're not like some freak who, you know, doesn't want to be still. And I remember distinctly like being all the way down at the bottom of the peanut butter jar and going, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's very interesting. Your question is how to sensitize uh, in the light of the fact that when you do slow down, you notice this terrible existential angst or feeling, right? In terms of sensitization, you're training different faculties at once. One of them is the sensory clarity aspect. So in other words, you're able to feel things that you previously didn't feel. Over time, let's say, you notice that you're able to detect more nuance maybe in your emotional life or something like that, or your physical life, something like this. Uh, more nuance maybe, or able just simply to detect things that you previously couldn't detect. They're always going on under the surface, but you couldn't detect them because your sensory clarity faculty is improving. And you're also training your concentration, your ability to pay attention to things, uh, whether you're trying to or not, actually. Because you can try to concentrate, uh, that's fine, but also there's your baseline of concentration. How concentrated are you when you're not trying to concentrate? And those are, sort of, they're of course, related to each other, aren't they? Over time, when you practice, your base, you can get yourself into a concentrated state. We, we can all do that if we have to. You know, I have to concentrate here. You know, we all do that. But also, over time, your baseline of concentration improves. So it's easier to be more concentrated when you're not trying, right? Uh, and then there's a third component, which is the ability to feel what it is that you detect. The willingness or ability to feel it without pushing it and pulling it. People sometimes call that equanimity. But that ability to feel what's there, these three, three things together, sensory clarity, concentration, and equanimity. So it's not just about feeling things. It's also about your willingness or ability to feel them. Otherwise, you just bounce off them because they're so unpleasant, right? 
Anyway, these three work together and they help each other. But I don't, we don't have exactly time for a whole lecture about that. So you've got a few options then in that case. Actually, it's a tremendous window. When you notice that there's this upwelling of this, is this existential pain that you're describing, it's a great window. And you've got few options as to what to do. You can actually turn your attention on the sensations of that existential pain. Uh -huh. That's quite good. So you can say, aha, this is one of the things that drives me. This is one of the things that sees me lurch from sensory input to sensory input. A tr sort of trying to get out of this or get away from this or numb this or replace it or drown it out in some sort of a way. This is the sort of thing that sees me uh, driven to behavior which I may later regret in a more sober state. <laughs> so uh, when you've got that tremendous momentum from a very busy, from a very busy day and you stop and uh, you know, you're, the rest of the day catches you and there's this horrible feeling, you can relax the body and tune into the sens sens sensations that constitute that terrible f suffering or something. It's, that would be classically be called the suffering or unsatisfactoriness or agitation, antsiness. You tune into it and you basically sizzle like a sausage in a pan in the uh, unpleasant feeling. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to sizzle like a sausage in a pan in an unpleasant feeling? That sounds masochistic. But actually, it's so that you can begin to understand it, so that you, you can begin to know it, so that you can begin also to l reduce your resistance to it, so that it can flow more easily in your body, can come and go more easily in your body, rather than, here it comes, oh, better do something, you know, whatever it might be. You know, nom, 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 you know, whatever. <laughs> so it's a great opportunity, because if you can begin to, to in a certain sense, um, face it, see it, know it to death, as they say, that's very, very good. Then you begin to, your threshold for its capacity to bounce you off into unconscious action gradually increases. So you need more of it for it to throw you off your, uh, you know, waking personhood. Mm -hmm. Who you are when you're not totally driven, right, let's say. Because if you're really, really driven, you'll, you, you lose a lot of IQ points that way, don't you? Well, I do. If I'm very driven, I lose a lot of IQ points, and I do things, reach for things, and so on. It may not be a bad thing, you know? Just, I'm just sort of lumbering around. So it's actually a great opportunity. Uh, yeah. So one of my favorite things to do for, for that very reason is have a really busy day, and then at the end of it, boom, stop, meditate, sit there. And because the intensity of the unpleasantness is so strong, you, you get more bang for your buck meditation-wise. <laughs> you know, you sit there on the mountain, everything's nice. It's good, but it takes a long time. But if you, if you, if you can sizzle like a sausage in a pan in the midst of a full upwelling of unpleasantness, you get sort of extra points in a way. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's great. Um, it's also good to do that with fatigue. If you notice yourself very tired, there's the feeling of fatigue, there's the physical symptoms, but there's also the uh, wriggly, horrible, uh, you know, worm on a hook feeling, which is the same sort of angst you're describing, that goes along with the fatigue. And they, pe they feel like the same thing, but they're not quite the same thing. The symptoms of fatigue are not the same as the, as the misery associated with being fatigued or ha having, like I do, a bit of a bunged up nose, you know, or feeling agitation in the body. Boredom, antsiness. Uh, right there is a tremendous window. Tune in to the flavor of antsiness. You know, <coughs> the flavor there. Yeah, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. So there's two, there's, well, there's several kinds of imprints that you can carry into your relationship. Uh, I'm going to list two that are worth exploring. One is things that have happened to you since you are actively in relationships. So let's say from the first time you had sex onward or the first girlfriend you had, maybe even before sex. So the first relational engagement where you were pretty much fresh from that thing that is relationship till now. That's one area where you can engage with your imprints. 
The other area is the stuff that you were imprinted with in your upbringing and through your family line. And those are both good areas of exploration. The family line, um, you usually start with your parents or the people who raised you and their relationship and how you perceive them and how you perceived love in your body. And of course, the way we first were imprinted to experience love is what we seek for in relationships. So let's assume your father only gave you attention when you did something wrong and then he screamed at you, but he was totally there with you then, right? Then in your body, that's in, in, your, in the child imprint of you, that's love, all right? So then, of course, when a woman is just there with you and loves you the regular way, that's not going to feel quite right. It's only going to feel quite, really right to that young part of your, your, that subpersonality, to, so to speak, when she's stark raving mad, giving you her full attention by, you know, giving it to you. Ah, you know, then one, the adult part of you goes, this is horribly abusive. And the child part of you goes, she loves me, she loves me, right? And so that, it becomes very disjointed there. So that's one layer of inquiry that you can engage in. And then the other one is, what are the things that have happened in your life that are now imprinted? So the expectations you have um, that, of things that will happen in your relationship. And those usually have sentences attached to them. I'll never be good enough. Or I'll never be able to please her. Or no one will ever understand me. Or, you know, it's, it's something that it has, a, it has a theme. And how you know it has a theme is you will hear yourself say these things in all kinds of situations, including romantic situations. And so those are is interesting things to inquire on, either with the help of a friend, journaling, self-inquiry, a good therapist, where you excavate those things. And when you, for instance, have that sentence, right, then um, you notice and it becomes almost humorous, almost. You know, you s <laughs> because it's like this ouch and ha ha you stand like let's say here in front of your partner here total stranger right and let's say your thing is i'm never going to do it quite right right let this is your sentence the first thing that's going to come out of the strange woman's mouth is well that was almost okay right for instance or whatever it is so she'll feed that to you because you're a walking talking um, target for that particular imprint. And so, and so even if that person doesn't know you, they can feel that thing, you know, that, that hole, and they'll go in there. Not on purpose, but just because that, that there's an opening. And so by excavating that and by knowing those sentences, you can see it coming. And when you can see it coming... There, is a, there are certain strategies, some of them we'll work with tomorrow, one of which is that you essentially give the very thing that you think you never can have. So let's just say you, you have it, um, no one will ever understand me. Right now you're standing across from a woman, this is an artificial situation, so it's easy to feel. And it happens again. You are saying what you need and you're not being understood. Or you're saying what you need and then she does the exact opposite. And you start hearing that sentence. Ah, no one is ever going to understand me, right? So in that moment, what you'll do is you'll do your very best to understand that person. And then in the act of giving the thing that you can't receive, it dents out that particular whole and you are less susceptible to exposing yourself to people who you know hook into that hole so that's one way that you can work with it there's many ways somatically you can work with it Psych psychologically you can work with it shamanically you can work with it it's too bad we just had those two days next time
but I think that will give you something to at least, you know, threads to go in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer this with a question. Why do you think that all your sexual offerings should be pleasing to you? And what I mean by that is when two people engage in sexual relational play, you're not just dealing with you. And so you, when you do you, so to speak, as they say, right, you can fully please yourself with the things that give you pleasure. And, you know, in self-practice and also when it's all about you. So if I say to him, hey, make it a sexually really exciting experience just for her, take yourself out of the equation, then he will know that that means um, you, want it, you, you want him dominant, right? It's pretty, it's pretty clear cut. First, get into the rose petal bath, bitch. <laughs> Have the chocolate. <laughs> Something like that. Right? Lick that chocolate off the corner of your rose petal bath. Yeah. So, so, so then he's giving you the kind of experience you want and the reward for him will be your flowering or your opening or your unfolding, your surrender, whatever word you want to put on there, right? Um, so that's really good. But there's a high chance that in that interaction, he's not getting all his itches scratched because it's for you, right? So then now if we go, um, you do something for him, Right? And this depends on the day also, right? I mean, so, some people are more sexually diverse and then it also depends on where you're, where you're sitting. Like, for instance, if he spends all day telling people what to do and doing a million things and planning stuff and, you know, uh, holding you down in all your chaos on top of everything else that gives him chaos, he is probably not going to want to dominate you because he's a bit worn out, right? So in that particular moment, when you go, but I need to be dominated, to him it's going to feel like more work, right? And the worst, case, the, wor the, the worst case scenario is he's annoyed and doesn't want to do it. The best case scenario is he's just really tired and can't. And that, but that doesn't make for a very satisfying thing. So if I would ask you to do a thing for him at the end of one of those days, mm -hmm. you know what he would enjoy. Mm -hmm. And that will and be enjoyable and wonderful and nourishing and fulfilling for him, but it's going to be a little bit mad for you because it's not your preference. Mm -hmm. And that's how it goes when two people have sexual engagement. Mm -hmm. It's not always going to be the thing for both people at the same time, right? Sometimes that happens spontaneously, right? Everything is aligned. You're both not in those spaces. Your kid's not requiring something. His job's not requiring something. You've had good but not too good meals. The stars have aligned, right? And, and then... <laughs> So, you know, then, it, it, then it's like it goes back and forth and it's all really good. But often there is a service mm -hmm. and an offering and a gifting in the sexual occasion that's super important. And when we look at relationships that sustain beyond the first, you know, heavy, sexy stuff, it's the relationships in which generosity is happening. And that's not always easy because, of course, when we're massively depleted, we don't want to be generous, right? If you have a tiny little breadcrumb and you haven't eaten in a long time, you don't want to give that thing up to somebody else, which is why it's important to, you know, holistically nourish yourself. But within the sexual occasion, the willingness to gift something that's not exactly your thing for the sake of his 
opening and nourishing. It's an offering. It's a service. It's a gift. And when you bring generosity to that gift, then that has an effect on your sexual body too. It makes you more abundant, mm -hmm. like your subtle body. And, um, and that, that's something that can't be had any other way, that abundance of your subtle body, that willingness to give, it, it potentiates and you become exponentially more, right? And so, so it's a really interesting thing to feel that, oh, I want to be doing this, oh, it's not for me, and then go, but I love this person and that is, this is my gift, right? And in that then something else happens. And then that enlivens the sexual relationship in other ways. But it's not necessary that both of you feel the same goodness in the same moment as long as over time and in the totality there is a giving and taking and a play and all of that. So the difference between that and compromise or martyring yourself is that you're full enough and that you're not coming from a place of manipulation or duress or obligation, right? So meaning, if you go, not you personally, but if one goes, oh, fuck, I need to fuck him tonight because he's not going to like it if I don't, and what am I going to do then? Where am I going to live? He's not going to love me anymore, <laughs> right? Like, people do that kind of stuff, right? And, and so now you feel the strong obligation to, be, to perform in a certain way so he continues giving you his part of the bargain. That sets up a really horrible dynamic. Or you have the... Oh, I guess that's just my wifely duties. I must do it. I have to have a stiff upper lip and just bear it and think of England or Australia or whatever. <laughs> because that's what one does, right? That, that martyr kind of thing. That's no good either. But when you have a certain amount of fullness and understanding between two people, then you can go, well, you know, all in all, here's the biggest picture of our relationship. And for the sake of that, I am gifting something that I'm willing to give freely. And here's the important piece. It's only a gift when it's a gift. It's not a gift when it's a tit for a tat, right? And also it's not, it's not a yes if you can't say no. So the other aspect, you hear me say this all the time. I'm like real a stickler for that. If you can't say no, I don't want this, you also can say, yes, I want this. Your yes means absolutely nothing when there isn't also a no. And so that's, that, those are some of the things to consider, that if you feel like gifting, you gift from a place of fullness and not obligation, and you also don't feel like if you say no or that you can't say no, right? And so you just do it, right? So those are dynamics, but within the general... Is it always enjoyable for you to be the one, you know, when he needs it to be the more dominant one so he can relax? No, but like you said, it moves you. And that, when you said that, that moving, that's the sign of the gift. Right? You're actually giving something to that person that opens them and how that feels in the body. You had some of this today I saw in quite a few people when you touch somebody else. Like that feeling of seeing that person's opening does something. It, it is a moving, opening. Um, you almost get teary kind of with this fullness of the heart. And that brings forth a, such a rich engagement uh, and intimacy, a true intimacy right, that you can't just have by performing rote sexual acts. Right? It's, it, it's a different kind of opening and surrender into something, even though you're not being taken there, you are being taken there. It's just a different layer. You have to feel how your body, mind, and heart, your subtle body, your spiritual, whatever you want to call it, opens and there's many ways to do that mm -hmm. and just because I, I'm with you I'm on the hyper submissive end of the spectrum sexually speaking mm -hmm. 
but not anywhere else in my life. I couldn't do what I'm doing if not for the fact that I have fairly strong uh, thrust and power and penetrative ability, and I can contain a room and I can make decisions and all of that. That's equally pleasurable to me than totally letting myself go. And I don't think I'm masculine for the fact that I'm actually really good at my job, right? I, I feel enlivened and full and happy in my body after a day like this, when I actually, you know, when you would, in the dogmatic sense, you would say, I was masculine, I told everybody what to do, I held a structure, I was on time, I ended on time. No, I didn't actually for once. <laughs> Usually I am very much ending on time, but this is such a good question, right? So you would, you would say that's masculine. But within that is extreme creative flow and enjoyment and pleasure in my body and pleasure in seeing you practice and all of that, which could be considered feminine. So um, you don't want to live your life believing that you have to be one thing. It's like you're just a 50s housewife with a neo-tantric sugar coating, right? Um, instead of uh, having the little you know, casserole in your little uh, 50s housewife outfit, you're now in the slut outfit with the um, cacao, right? <laughs> but but you're, you're still doing the exact same shit and your guy is doing the exact same shit. Now he's just doing it in a sarong instead of a suit, <laughs> you know? There's more to life than those stereotypes, and how you orient to that is you feel your heart, you feel the gifts you can give and receive, and you have some basic generosity, and then you learn some skills like we're doing here so that your offering all around has more skill to it. Because the reason why people can't do these things isn't because they don't want to or they're stupid. It's because you have to train your body to do these things. I mean, nobody would put you in a room with a piano and say, play a concert, right? You wouldn't do that. You'd have to learn how to play the piano. But somehow everybody expects that you can go in with a lover to bed and you know how to play a concert without ever having practiced certain things or learned music theory or learned how to read notes and learned how to... Whatever, right? And so skill development is not the same as religious dogma or a lifestyle. No. And why not have it all? Why not be able to be emotionally intelligent and expressive, uh, deeply feeling, turned on, being able to get shit done or let it all go? For both men and women, I mean, life isn't such that all dudes go to the factory in the morning while all women stay home and bake beautiful casseroles, right? That's no longer the case. And neither is the tantric thing true, you know? We, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not laying about at home, uh, you know, massaging my glistening body with coconut oil while preparing, you know, the feast for the evening and have nothing else to do. I have a life to live. And I still want good sexual interaction and you just learn tools and you do what you want to do when you want to do it. And that's where we're going to end today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs>